Uh, okay, so this will also be a one hour class. So basically, I have cut down your break after this class between tutorial and this. Uh, but anyway, uh, the idea is to go slow and so that you absorb everything. Okay, so uh, before we move forward, just a very quick recap. What we did last time is looking at the properties of the foregrounds, both spatial and spectral, what it decides, those mechanisms. And I think you also did a nice tutorial on that. So before we actually start, um, we had a question for you. So you all did the spectral index in the galaxy, of the galaxy. And you saw a difference like typically the slope of your spectrum is flatter so the spectral index is of a lower value along the galactic plane and it is steeper of the galaxy so any any thoughts on why this is and we are only talking about diffuse emission here Okay, so what decides this spectral index, right? What, what decides the slope of the line? Great. So you have basically the energy distribution of electrons. Now, when would you see a spectrum flat? When you have more electrons towards the higher energies. So your spectrum becomes flat. And if you have less electrons at the higher energy, it becomes steep. So this number will be higher there. So why do you think there are more energetic electrons here and less there? Fermi electrons are Fermi accelerated, correct. Yeah. Okay. More magnetic fields. Sorry? Great. All of these are correct answers. Because in order to accelerate electron more and more, you need higher magnetic field. But more importantly, you need more supernovae to have. Uh, because one of the ways for Fermi acceleration takes place is via shocks. And shocks predominantly are produced by supernova explosion. And ideally, you will have supernovae where you have a lot of star formation. So, star formation rate is, as you all know, very high in the galactic plane. That's where majority of the stars form. And very few here. So, basically, you have a lot of opportunities for electrons to be accelerated to very high energies. That's why you see. By the time these migrate and diffuse, so there are diffusion models of cosmic rays, right? So these very energetic electrons diffuse out to the tails. But in the process, they lose energy. So your spectrum, which was like this, becomes like this. The high energy part is lost, which is what's shown. Anyway, so that was just a quick bit from the last time. Let's get started from here. Okay, so... Sorry. Different pixels, frequencies. Okay. I was conveniently ignoring that part. Okay. You're talking about these two. So when you take spectral index from 50 megahertz to 150 megahertz, you get something like this. When you take uh, 408 and uh, 1420, you get this. So correct. your spectral index is in general higher at higher frequencies and lower at lower frequencies. And this has also been observationally confirmed by majority of experiments. Good, so you brought it up. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, of course they will. I mean, there has to be a reason. Yeah, think about it. Yeah. It all is the physics of synchrotron, nothing else. So again, uh, if your spectral index is steep, it means there is an energy loss. That correlation is straightforward because you have low electron, no electrons have very high energies. That's why you have steeper ones here and uh, flatter ones there. So the simple reason I think did not cover this during the physics of synchrotron is when electron is gyrating in a magnetic field, it's also losing energy in the process, right? It's radiating energy. And you'll find that the rate of energy loss is proportional to the frequency. So at the higher the frequency, the higher is energy loss. So basically these electrons will lose energy faster than this. So as you move to higher and higher frequency, you are, again, this is not universal, but more likely you will find 
steeper it gets spectral emissions and actually this is one of the ways people reduce ages of galaxy so if you have a very continuum broadband spectrum and if you see a change in the spectral index as a, as a function of frequency you can use that to determine because you know initial conditions and you know at what rate electrons are losing energy so you can deduce how long this galaxy has been there so great question Hmm. Yeah, because in general, you will always have star formation in the galaxy, independent of what frequency you are looking at. So, in general, you will find more energetic electrons in the disk, and less energetic electrons in the halo. That will be independent of what frequency you observe. But if you split them into two different bands, there is a second order effect that comes with the aging of population of electrons, which is faster at high frequencies. Okay, so you also played around with GSM and you were able to produce these nice sky maps. These are the principal components, by the way, that we ended at last time. So we'll resume from here. So GSM, as you know, was very data driven approach. You were deriving your basis functions from the sky models themselves which were basically this and trying to find out there what is the best linear combination that represents your data the best. This is data driven. So a lot of people asked after the class two, which is what, what about the accuracy of the maps themselves, right? Because if you are solely basing your basis functions on the data and your data is incorrect or has systematics, that would translate to your sky models too. And that is absolutely correct. So there is an alternate model which I'll start off today, and that's called GMOS. So this is again this is there in the reference that I've shared with you. So what GMOS does is slightly different. Your data set still remains the same, which is you have uh, basically these maps. So the input is exactly the same, and for each pixel, you have values which are brightness temperature values in Kelvin units at different frequencies. So just like what you did in tutorial, you picked up a pixel and you plotted what is the brightness of that pixel as a function of frequency. You can do that with the real data. But then the question is, how do you model it? And how do you fill in the missing gaps? Our whole idea is that we should have something which allows us to generate maps in these gaps. And there are these very wide gaps. So in GMOS, what you do is Instead of modeling at each pixel as a function of frequency using basis functions, which are principal components, you basically take advantage of the underlying physics. So I can't go into the details here, but I'll just uh, do some basic pressure. Uh, you model that as a function of frequency, you have spectral index, which is decided by your synchrotron. And as you uh, rightly asked, you can actually have different spectral indices at different frequency. And that is called spectral break. So you basically have alpha 1 and alpha 2 as two different spectral indices. And they have their, their own regimes where they operate. But this is all about synchrotron. You can also have other things. You can have thermal emission. So there is a TE term. And then you can also have a free free emission. So what you can do, again, no need to go into the details of equation. You can parameterize. You can parameterize the variation of brightness as a function of frequency for different pixels. And you come up with six or seven term parameter model that has physics of synchrotron, Remstaller, and thermal emission. And then you try to model it with the given data. So this is more physics driven approach rather than data driven approach. And you will find all kinds of complexities. So if you looked at, you know, all different pixels that you had on that sky map, you will find all kinds of spectra. Some will be what we call a Sonkiel spectra, where your spectral index is flatter, steeper there and then becomes flat. Most of them will be convex, which is what we discussed. It will be flatter at low frequencies. It will be steeper at high frequencies. <laughs> but you can also have combinations. Where, for example, if your um, uh, absorption at low frequency happens. So I also asked some question at uh, those there. Between uh, 1 to 10 megahertz, you will actually see a turnover. And that is because there is a self-absorption. The optical depth increases at low frequency. And then you can also have something flattening, which is the free-free emission taking off. The Bremstollen. For those who don't know, 
in one sentence bremsen stalling is the emission if an electron passes by a proton it gets accelerated by it and any accelerating charge radiates that's all so that's a one line summary of how this part happens and there its spectral behavior is very different from cyclotron so you will have all different kinds of shapes and for each pixel you can determine which shape is the most optimal shape basically now you have a functional form based on your optimization this is for the same sky maps so sky maps don't distinguish what's galaxy and what's not right you are measuring at a given region what's the brightness but yes predominantly it's it's galactic origin because diffuse emission is dominated by galactic emission but for example there are extended regions along the disk where you might at for some pixels dominated by other things another thing to note since you brought it up is the spatial resolution so here all maps are downgraded and i think you guys also did a downgrade in your uh, tutorial to 5 degrees and the reason is that these frequencies we are talking about tens of megahertz to 100 megahertz a few degrees are typical resolution of the maps again lambda by d so at very large lambda your spatial resolution is poor So at those degree scales, you are mostly sensitive to the diffuse part, which is again galactic in nature. So this is basically distribution of spectral index, similar to what you had plotted for the global sky model. Uh, but yeah, so there are pros and cons of each uh, method. You have data-driven approaches, you have physics-driven approaches. You can both of them give you some way to model the full sky at all the frequencies where you really don't have the measurements, right? um do they agree no <laughs> um and therefore it is important and that's one take away message that you should really have is uh, don't trust foregrounds uh if people say uh, foregrounds are taken care of they're lying uh, <laughs> uh they are not because we don't understand them to that extent yeah so uh, the spectral breaks yeah The spectral features remain the same. Their explanations are the same. But the point is, when you interpolate it at different frequencies where you don't have maps, the results are not the same. So uh, really, there is no other substitute than going out and making more sky maps, which will help everyone. To some extent, it's being done. There are lots of sky surveys being done, but those are mostly for the point sources, which are very important for interferometers. What Prashun talked about the compact sources. Well, here we are we are more concerned about the diffuse sources. so this this is still an ongoing research a lot of people are trying to model these things uh, not just model for you know subtracting them out but also to study them because there is a lot of galactic interest in this so yeah so this field is evolving not at all right no 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 so basically you can put the offset so basically these maps <coughs> these maps have calculated the offset and put it in the map so basically for all the foreground models that i talked about the input maps are absolute values of kelvin not the fluctuating part so yeah so that's the point the input maps themselves are processed in different ways like w map for example does not have a dc term but when you look at the w map data release lambda they have computed the some way the offset and put it in all the pixel so we basically use that it will propagate and that will affect both the models whether you are looking at data driven or physics driven and that's why really one has to just like hasla map one has to really make absolute calibrated measurements of the sky at these frequencies and many of these global experiments one of the science goal beyond the 21 cm is to be doing that because in some way we do make the most accurate measurements of the sky so one of the actually science of this is to characterize foregrounds better so both saras experiment and edges we have also fixed some of the spectral indices of the some of the frequencies here they were wrong as you rightly said the offset was also wrong the scaling was also wrong at 150 megahertz and 45 megahertz so we we gave that revised values yeah so in general foreground modeling is a very very ongoing research area and uh, it's not only crucial for 21 cm but also crucial for its own physics okay so that's about the foreground models uh, any questions till now this one 
Right. So this comes from these equations actually. So basically, you derive your uh, each pixel into either convex spectra or concave spectra, which is these two. Whether your spectral index becomes flatter or steeper, and that you can just visually decide, or also just compute the spectral index like what you did in the tutorial. And rest of the parameters are fixed. So the electron temperature, the optical depth, these things are something that you solve for by looking at say six or seven sky maps across your frequency range. So these are the best fit spectra from different pixels. So yeah. Diffuse. Because we are looking at five degree scales here. Right. Precisely. And those models are basically physical models. So you can have some intuition of what they should be like electron temperature. It can't be negative. But it has to be order of say thousand Kelvin. So similarly for all these, unlike PCA where it's all data driven, so really there is no physical intuition in physics based ones. At least you can corroborate with earlier measurements of spectral index, uh, this uh, turnover frequency, all different kinds of parameters that are there. What is this? Oh, that I don't know. Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, there's a table I can share it with you. I don't know on top of my head. And I think now there have been more additions to it. Yes. Yes. And also, I'm more interested in this part. So, there's LWA maps now, which are at 30 megahertz or so. So it might be worth adding them and redoing this to see if you want to, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so these are not from the same pixel though. So they are from, uh, if you look at the foreground map, they are sampled randomly from different places. All it means is the physics at different regions of your sky are different. So at some, uh, for example, if you are looking closer to the galactic plane, you will basically have a much flatter spectrum. And at some regions, you will basically start entering the absorption, the self-absorption domain. So then it will flatten also. This is what you see, for example, for this pixel. Yeah, yeah, so sorry, I, I should have mentioned. So this is not the same pixel. These are solutions coming from different regions of the sky just to show that there is a huge diversity of spectral behavior depending on where you are looking at. Any other questions? <coughs> Great. So this is all about foregrounds. This is just an introduction. I'll be happy to talk more about it because it's very, very important for whatever you do. Uh, but we'll move to another foreground before we move to antennas. I don't think I can start antennas today, but I'll see. Very quick introduction to another program. So basically we are following the cosmology. The 21 centimeter signal you've already studied. Foregrounds are done. Next in the line has to be naturally ionosphere. And I think some of you are also working on this, which is great. So reason is why this is important, first of all. And the answer is that we have free electrons in ionosphere. And these free electrons basically present themselves as equivalent optical depth and that is one aspect which is it's like a medium just like any other medium you have an optical depth so there will be a partial absorption there will be a transmission all of those characteristics will hold but more importantly this their refractive index is actually a complex quantity and that creates problems so as you can see here on the graph you have this eta square Eta square is nothing but the refractive index of the atmosphere. Uh, so, uh, the two frequencies that you see there are basically the frequencies uh, in the ionosphere. One is called the collision frequency of electrons, and one is basically the plasma frequency, below which you have a cutoff. But this is a complex quantity. We will be talking about two different layers here. One layer is this called F layer, which is much higher. 
one is called D left. And uh, as you can imagine, the actual density, the gas density, decreases once you go up. So you have much sparse regions in the F layer, denser region in the D layer. So we will basically look at both of these, F layer and D layer. And the, the, the reason why we would want to make the distinction is because of their different densities, where the way they affect the incoming side signal is different. So the way to answer this is how do they change the incoming side signal? And we are talking about in terms of electricity. For a distance of data, is, what you are looking at is this. So, our data is so data is the difference, which is the the uh, incremental length that it travels. And data is by C is basically the delay. Okay. And this is where your uh, refractive index comes. So now what happens is if your refractive index is imaginary or predominantly imaginary, come basically at side the at edge. So it will nothing but it will absorb some of the side. But mind it, there is a frequency difference. Mean 25 centimeter cosmology, if anything has a table that has you please be very careful. So same happens with the answer. The other way, if it is uh, real or mostly real. It's not a lossy video, but it's a refractive video. It adds additional phase to your income. So these two regimes are very much in here. So F layer is mostly refractive region because it is predominantly real quantity. Your uh, because it is less dense, your collision frequency is very small. You can actually completely ignore the imaginary problem. And it's reverse for the real. So the question is what happens? So suppose you assume sky to be a power field. and now you have something which is coming at an angle of theta but because of this refractive index here you are getting an additional phase. So in some way the, the theta that the, the as seen from observer it's getting refractive. So rhinospheric basically acting like a lens, spherical lens. So we'll, we'll talk about how it affects the index. So I can't really derive this angle of deviation because that's what matters the most. Then you can imagine just from this expression, it depends on at what theta is coming and at what frequency is coming because your refractive index itself is frequency. Okay. So what There are a lot of theta dependent terms, I am just collapsing them into a single function g theta. But basically, your deviation here is proportional or inversely proportional to the frequency squared times your cos theta. Theta being the angle of theta. So, this is a very nice paper again in the references that I mentioned. Um, if I take this and I have written this, the, the deviation. So, just to interpret this plot. The y axis is how much deviation is happening at different frequencies. Right? So you can see at very low frequency your deviation shoots up. That is one takeaway. The other takeaway is how the angles coming at different uh, sky signals coming at different angles are attenuated. And again, you can see there is a strong frequency difference. There is a cos theta term screen. So the highest of the deviation occurs here, and then it goes down. So, but that is one aspect, but then the question is eventually what is it going to do with my observations, right? So, you know there is a refraction effect, right? Plus sense. This one. Ah, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I have to look it up. I like that. And yeah, theta just that uh, it's defined from the horizon. So why are you going? Oh, sorry. So it's it's a there is whole factor comes in. 
This is basically your scale height by the radius of the earth. But it's basically this combination. But basically what we want to know is, so in some way, and I'll come to that later when I talk about antennas, you have a field of view, and I think we discussed a bit about this, which is a constraint with frequency. And in any for all 29 centimeter experiments, you will want this property in your antenna, which is energy. So you will want your field of view to be constant. It should not change in frequency. Let's say we take that. We have a field of view V of theta, which is for very elementary antennas, we know it is say, cos theta. Or in the power units, cos square theta. So theta being from horizon. At horizon, you have the maximum response and it's going down as you go up. So you can take whatever function form, but the idea is it's only dependent on elevation, it's not dependent on the frequency. Now, what is that does? The ionosphere group. It introduces an effective chromatism, which means even if your actual beam is frequency independent, because it is stretching your deviation differently at different frequencies, you can basically absorb this effect in your frequency. So, the, the, the signal which was coming at theta now will come as cosine square of theta minus delta theta. And this delta theta term will use from ionosphere. And you can do the math, you just make one approximation, which is uh, the deviation is smaller compared to the actual value. So, that basically gives us cos square theta plus mu square some zero theta not ready but two. So all the thing is follows the equation. For all the for all the angles. And the magnitude and, and these are different different lines are different angles. So the effects are different at different angles. But yes, this effect is there of course. In this, this frequency, this variation may be different. Precisely this plot. So, at 90 degree, for example, you have this deviation. 20 degree, you have this deviation. This is from object or something? No, this is analytically done, this plot. But uh, observationally, people who study atmosphere, it's very clear. There is, a, there is an angle dependence to how much it is. For global signals, we don't have reflection because we, we span nearly half the sky at any In context with global signals, we don't have to ask each other. What is more important is um, get there, which is the actual electron density itself. It's better to observe at places where the electron density is there. Then all of these effects will scale down upon them. That is more important than regions of the sky when it comes to global signals. Yes, great point. So that is basically one limitation. This is all done assuming the electron density of the electron is one. The, the density T C what we call total electron mass. In real life, that will never be the case. So now imagine this. Now imagine this fluctuating every second. Because it's directly proportional to your electron mass. So this is basically you can imagine one snapshot of atmosphere. And what has happened in that snapshot? But it will change literally every second. Huh. So then you can assume different TEC. You can have an angular dependence on TEC. It's proportional. So there is a TEC term that I have not written. Essentially, TEC is a proportional. So its magnitude will be higher if you have more electrons. So electron content you can be that can be a function of time, can also be a function of theta. Also latitude, like where you are observing from. <laughs> ah, so here because this is all in analytical treatment, so this means closure time. Um, typically when we observe, do you want to know the time resolution? Time resolution is order of the second. Second or less. 
but dilution fluctuates even in this range. So the question is for that snapshot, all you have is you started off with a beam which was frequency independent, but because of the refraction index, you have this. So essentially, you are now making your beam frequency dependent simply because of this. Yeah. Ah, so beam is not changing. This is a way of describing atmosphere. Which is if you are looking in theta, because of refraction, you are actually sampling some other space. You can absorb that effect in your beam in math, not in real. In reality, your beam remains stationary. So basically, what I'm saying is that data theta, the deviation that you see is frequency. Now, another, so your beam is looking at a theta angle. So you multiply the gain of that angle. But there is an ionosphere because of which you are really not looking at theta, but data theta. So I'm absorbing this effect in my beam. So this is just for because ideally what we want to do is this. Uh, I'll come back to that equation because that is really the most important one. This at the end of the day, it all boils down to. What is it that we have? What is my antenna temperature? And you can see it's a convolution of your beam and your photons. So Prashun also touched upon it. There is an extra exponential term in it. So now I can make my B as cosine square theta plus nu square g theta instead of just cosine square theta. Right? So in some way we are trying to understand what ionosphere is doing. Yeah. So this is not the reality. It's just a model to represent that reality. So you can do this homework, which is replace this b by uh, cosine square theta plus nu square of theta. What you will find is your t a, because this is your quantity of interest, will be some function of nu raised to minus alpha. Minus alpha simply comes because you are foreground and assuming a power, which is what we had seen in synchrotron and other physics. But you have an extra function. And this part comes from minus two. Can you all see? You're not able to see. I'll write it there. So basically, initially, if you took a cosine square beam only, so basically you ignored the ionosphere completely, you would have got this. This is just synchrotron physics. Now, once you make that B of theta as cosine square theta plus this new density minus two factor that comes from interaction. You will add one more term. So, in some way, because of this refraction, when you observe, you will probably see another power law, which is related to synchrotron because it has alpha term, but there is a minus 2 because your entire ionospheric effect, the refraction aspect, has that kind of a dependence. So, this another factor of minus 2 really comes from the deviation angle. Your deviation angle itself is frequency dependent. So this is fine. If, as an observationalist, I would say, oh, great. So I have to model it as alpha. I'll also add another free parameter and I'll model that. The problem arises because of this question. This is not stationary, right? So the amplitude of this term will keep on changing for different and different times. So you have to very actively correct for it. It's not like one correction because your electron density is changing. So, it's still a research problem. Um, how do you correct? There have been a lot of papers on this. Uh, we have to have very accurate TC measurements and this is very pronounced at low frequencies. So, you better have very realistic corrections done in the data or at least have places where the TC is very less so these effects are very reduced. But there are implications to this effect is what I want to say. There is another effect in ionosphere that deals with absorption. So till now we had studied the layer, which is refraction. The D layer, what happens is this electric field eta, it's, it's now uh, imaginary because you have a denser medium, your collision frequency increases. But that is more straightforward than this because once it's real, you know it's an attenuating factor. And attenuating factor, 
without deriving it is this. So you can do exactly the same kind of things that we have done here. But now, the way you change your beam is cosine square theta being your original beam, you change it to cosine square theta minus delta theta. In this case, what you will do is you will make your beam as cosine square theta plus some loss factor, which is theta comma frequency, which is exactly that expression. And you can see how qualitatively it changes. It, the attenuation is pronounced most at the low frequency. So in general, it's a rule of thumb, ionosphere is just bad at low frequency. So the moment you go below 100 megahertz, you better be very careful with ionosphere. And again, with different angles, you have different sizes. So the angle of 90 will have really the most loss. And as you, as you go to higher and higher angles, the attenuation is less because again, it's around the path that the day travels. So these are the two major effects, which is refraction and absorption. And now again, the kind of question we asked before, what does it do to the antenna temperature? You can do the same exercise here. So there you had replaced your B of theta with this cos, cos square of theta minus delta theta. You can replace your B of theta as cos square theta times loss function. And you surprisingly find the effect remains the same which is, it, again, it reduces a new square term. Again, because your loss is a new square term dependent. But the effect of these things are very different. So in this paper, for example, um, there is a simulation which is done where you take in the ionospheric effects, these two effects, uh, refraction and absorption, and look at how the brightness temperature is changing uh, with time and frequency. Uh, this is not a very typical sky model. This is a very elementary toy model. But what is important is to see difference. So this is a differential plot between the expected foregrounds from a given sky model. It could G, GSM, GMOS doesn't matter. The same model when you propagate with these effects here, right? Where, where, where you are effectively stretching the beam or effectively attenuating the beam, you get something else, you difference the two. And that average of the difference is this plot, excess foregrounds. So just because you have ionosphere, you have hundreds of Kelvin excess in your data. So if you're really doing some kind of an absolute calibration of how much of my TF is, first you have to correct for ionospheric effects. And anything that you find out will always be greater than the amplitude of the signal. That's just the rule of thumb of this community. So the signal lies here. So the excess that you get is order of 100 to 10 Kelvin. Your signal is 100 milli Kelvin as usual. Out of which you have uh, loss terms dominating over the refraction. But again, these are very nuanced uh, numbers. Uh, it delves into what EC is, what kind of distribution you have taken, and so on and so forth. But overall, the take home message, as far as ionosphere is concerned, is this, which is there are substantial effects that are happening at low frequencies. It might also impact power spectrum um, in some other ways, but I can't go into the details of those. But as far as the global signal is concerned, all it does is it introduces additional frequency dependence in your beam effectively, right? Because of which you see these excesses. The differences is a function of frequency and time. And you have just averaged it to get that black line. Okay. Between the um, say absolute value of the foreground from one of the sky models and once you propagate it through these effects what is the difference like when you observe you get ta1 and ta2 one with ionosphere one without ionosphere with and without ionosphere you subtract this is the difference hi the color scale generally ionospheric effects are most pronounced at low degrees So that's because your sky is drifting. So basically, it's also dependent on the absolute brightness of the sky right? because it's a fractional effect. So in absolute value, if your sky is very bright, your effect will also be very high. It's not a fractional difference, right? It's just a difference. So that pattern comes because which region of the sky falls in your field of view at what time? So, 
Okay. Ah, that's all because LST decides what field you are looking at. So when you have a galaxy in your beam, right, you will have a larger axis because your intrinsic part itself has shot up, uh, which is I think around what uh, this this area. That's where the galaxy is. So you will see brightest axis is there. So this is yeah. Atmosphere most prominent at low frequencies, yeah. Ah, because most of these effects are uh, this one by new square points. Why? Oh, this ties to the, the refraction index. What is the refraction index of atmosphere? So all the new square terms source from it. So at low frequencies, for example, those who do imaging, they'll see the point source changing very rapidly because you know it's causing refractions and those refractions are time dependent scintillations so you will see the source positions changing a lot and that becomes very important for say very long baseline interferometry effects okay uh, any other questions till now the foreground is bad ionosphere is bad these are the two summaries <laughs> uh, yeah Sorry, which observations? Real observations, huh? Yeah. Again, it, it ties up with the field of view. For global signals, you have, say, 50 degree wide beam. So it's very, really hard to avoid any photon. But yes, for example, yesterday you saw, uh, when you do an observation in July and in December, in one you have very bright foregrounds, one you have very weak foregrounds. So you might want to schedule your observations where you have cleaner patches. In general, foregrounds will be simpler, like even the intrinsic component. And also these ionospheric effects, because they're multiplicative in nature, and they do depend on your intrinsic foregrounds, you'll be better off. But having said that, in power spectrum, this is a bigger deal, because you can literally get to choose your deal. Like, while in global experiments, uh, less, uh, less uh, flexibility is there. But yeah. In principle, you can you can use them. Any other questions? So this is Vedantam at all. This was all done for static ionosphere. Uh, there is a very nice paper by Abhuru uh, that deals with dynamic ionosphere. So this is one level of problems. There is another level of problem that arises because the TC is changing, and that basically introduces additional layer of statistical noise, what we call as 1 by F noise. I can't even go into the details, but that is also very equally concerning when it comes to ionosphere. So you either model this properly or fly out of ionosphere. Uh, we are pursuing both. Okay. But till now, if there are no questions, I'll go to the very last part of the foreground aspect. We started at 3.30, is it? Okay. So we are 30 minutes. Good. Um, so last part of foregrounds is how we model them. So till now we have understood, okay, we can generate models of foregrounds. We try to understand what ionosphere is doing. Um, but when you have the real data, how do you model that? And unlike interferometers, we have very limited options, right? So there is, in, in global experiment, there is no foreground avoidance, right? So I, I, I really, uh, I'm very glad that Roshan covered this just before my lecture. Um, and this is just a snapshot of the foreground avoidance technique. That is, when you take the Fourier transform of your incoming sky signals, what you see is, and that is called delay. The frequency Fourier counterpart is delay. In the delay regime, you basically contain the foreground. And this simply comes from two effects. There is a geometric delay in different sources. So you have a maximum delay when the source is at the horizon. So your maximum delay will be just the baseline divided by speed of light. The maximum delay possible for any signal. But there is a second factor, which is the spectral complexity. So this argument holds when you have a flat spectrum source. We know none of the sources are flat spectrum. They have shapes. So in some way, you will have a convolution of actual distance and the shape of the source. Now, foregrounds we saw are also spectrally smooth. They are not flat, but they are power law like you will have some, it's not a delta function, it will have some spread centered at some delay. But the good part about foreground in the Fourier space, 
is that it's still contained. It, it's limited to some ranges of delay. Now, how does it apply to global signals? So this was a bit of interferometry and like experiments like HERA where I work on, we basically don't look here at all. We look elsewhere where we don't expect foreground contamination. But for global signal, the takeaway message is that in order to model foregrounds, you need very less Fourier components right? because of the spectral behavior. So because in Fourier space, they are contained in Q terms. If you do the same exercise with the signal and you saw I think signal and if you don't remember, I'll just uh, pull that up again here. The signals are spectrally very complicated here. All the 21 centimeter signals you can generate, most of them will have number of turning points. One of dark ages, one of cosmic dawn, one of deionization. And even under different models, they'll have all these different variations. So when you take a Fourier transform of this versus Fourier transform of this, you will get very different results. So this will survive even to higher Fourier modes. This won't, this will be contained. So coming back to frequency space, the way you can think about it is or modeling it with, with say some kind of a polynomial where you will need very few number of terms to model this and very large number of terms to model this. So in some way across global 21 centimeter experiment landscape, and this is something I'll cover in my last class, what kind of experiments are there right now? You will see that all of us rely on one single thing, which is the spectral difference between the two. So you can take whatever your choice of sky model, your choice of ionosphere, but at the end of the day, you have to rely on this. That your foreground and signals have intrinsically very different spectral behaviors. Okay, any questions? And this is just a representation of the same thing that I said. So the blue line is one of the sky models uh, at a region of pixels averaged together by following that equation. And the red is one of the global, one of my favorites global signal model. I hope this is true. Um, the red one is basically the brightness of the signal and the blue is the brightness of the foregrounds. And you can see the contrast. This is 5000 to 1000 Kelvin. And this is 0 to around 175 millikelvin. So, if I took this kind of an expression to model it, you see that after some number of orders, if you just had foregrounds in your data with no signal, you will go down to the noise field. So, the fluctuations you are seeing is basically artificially added thermal noise. But if you have both of these in your data, you will get something like this, which is closely correlated with the spectral shape of your signal. So this is just a quantification of what I said, which is foregrounds can be modeled because of its spectral behavior by a very few number of terms, unlike the signal that is spectrally more complex. So this is the crux of foreground separation when it comes to global signals. We can have variety of different ways, but the underlying basis is this. Now, the usually the question when you take the real data is where do you stop? So you can go to as high orders as possible and at some point you will start erasing the signal also. The signal and foregrounds are not orthogonal to each other. They have degeneracy. So the moment you take out say the linear term, the quadratic term, you are also taking out bits and pieces of the signal and that's why it's not 100% the same. Along with foregrounds, you have fitted out some part of it. And if you keep on increasing your complexity by increasing your order, you will you'll see that this starts to reduce and reduce and reduce. So how do you tackle this is the question. So one of the ways, and that's what my last part of the foreground will be, uh, what we call is maximally smooth function. It's a polynomial. Um, so I'll come to those results later. So it's, it's exactly the same function. But the idea is in a typical polynomial, you have an unconstrained function. The more parameters you add to AIs, you will basically allow it to fit more and more of this. So the question was, can we do something to not allow that to happen? That is, you can go to as high order as possible, but you will not give it the flexibility to fit this independent of what the order is. So that was maximally smooth function. And the way it's done is you start constraining the derivatives. So 
the way to distinguish is between the two is inflection points. So when you look at the derivative of the foreground and derivative of the signal, you'll find in the signal the derivative keeps on changing signs very often because it has lots of maxima minima and even higher order derivatives, right? So it's not just a second order derivative. Signal on the other hand, in spite of all the complicated physics we discussed, can be good. So the idea is you fit a polynomial, that's fine. But constraints its derivatives to never change signs. They should either be strictly positive across frequency or strictly negative across frequencies. Now, it's seemingly, it's very simple to implement in a code, right? So you compute quadratic, cubic, fourth order, fifth order, and for each order, you will get a derivative as a function of frequency. You only allow the solutions where it has not changed its sign, because a sign change in the derivative is a inflection point. So that will erase some part of the signal. So the beauty of this approach, though it's very simple, is independent of which order you go, 10th, 12th, 100th, it will never fit the signal. In some way, you are filtering very specific modes in your data. So, for example, if I took an unconstrained polynomial, which is just this, without constraining its derivatives at all, you'll see that as I increase my orders from 7 to 10 to 20, you can see my signal amplitude starts to go down accordingly. Expected. That's what polynomials are supposed to be. But if you just constrain these derivatives, the story completely changes. So you can't see other colors, but they're all there. Uh, 7, 10, 20, you go, what, whatever. Your, your signal will never be wiped out. And this is simply because derivatives of the signal has zero crossings, which we are not allowing to happen in our model. So you are very able to very cleanly separate foregrounds and the signal. So this is one of the approaches that we take, at least for our experiment, and also now other experiments have started using this to separate the two things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can try this on all the different possibilities. Like this is just one possibility. In general, we have varied the huge parameter space of the signal. And this turning point notation continues to hold there. It's very hard to produce a global signal that does not have inflection points. That is systematic. I'll come to that later. Yes, we are talking about intrinsic properties. So you have you have a you have a frequency independent beam. You are observing your GSM sky, and you are adding the signal and studying that. Yeah, real life will touch upon after this. Motivation for. Because a priori you don't know either. You don't know your foregrounds. When you have the data, your data has everything. It has foregrounds, it has signal, it has noise. And it has systematics. We'll ignore them for time. Now, if you are using an unconstrained polynomial, how do you know when to stop? Because a priori you don't know how complicated your foregrounds are. Or a priori you don't know which signal you're looking for. There can be any signal. So that is the motivation. So when you constrain this, you can go as high as you want. It doesn't matter, you will recover the signal. While if you use unconstrained, the higher you go, because you probably don't know how your foregrounds are behaving, you will end up losing the signal. So at some point you stop detecting the signal even if you would, it was there and you had the sensitivity because you have wiped it out. So in some way you are giving less freedom to your model to put out the signal. That's the motivation. The thermal noise. This one. Oh, it's wiped out in second or three orders. So here it doesn't exist. You have gone to seventh. There is no foreground by them. It's like this. But as as you said, it works when your instrument is not doing anything funny. And that's that's really the bottleneck. And really the most important statement of the day. These things work if your instrument does not corrupt these spectral behaviors. Right? We are still talking about intrinsic behaviors of things. 
and that's where we'll come to next which is now what happens when you actually put an antenna out because then it may destroy these properties and therefore these models may not work any other questions till now i'll show you any other questions this one so essentially you had two data sets in one data set you only had blue line and in another data set you had a summation of the two and you modeled them exactly by this function yes. yeah so the one which only had foregrounds got to the noise and the one that had the sum of the two survived because you basically recovered the entire signal yes. You did the same thing, but now you did not use the constraints of derivatives. You just fitted it in an unconstrained view. That's how we typically do that. Unconstrained polynomial. Always rational for the different orders. For the same program, yeah. so, the more order you go to, the more signal you lose out. Because it fitted, it's fitted out in your model. So if you get that red line, can you decipher what signal you started off? So what is the difference between the The constraints on the derivative. So the key is you have to make sure that derivatives don't have zero crossings. Then it will not fit your signal at all because your signal relies on that. It has turning points. It has zero crossings in the derivative. So this affection the beginning part is random. It's different. <laughs> this part. Because this part is degenerate to the foregrounds. So that you can't help. Like if you even if you pick out the first two three terms, that 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 term which is there in the signal will also be taken out. It's like filtering. If you are filtering some low frequency modes, it doesn't matter whether those low frequency modes come from your foregrounds or they come from the signal. They will be filtered. And th this is the difficulty of global experiments because you have very less measurements. You only have time versus frequency. So differentiating them is challenging. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Noise is very subdominant here. This is just a process of filtering. You can imagine you are doing a Fourier filtering uh, for these signals. So you are uh, basically filtering out low frequency modes. So the low frequency mode of the red one is also gone. So it's not not to do with noise. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, if not, then. In the last 15 minutes, I want to give you an introduction of real life. <laughs> so what happens when you actually put an antenna there, right? So this was all very nice. And ideally things should work. Practically it works. Okay. <clears throat> so when we design a system, and this is independent of radio astronomy, we need a detector. So till now we were only thinking about intrinsic signals, but ideally you need something to sense that. And at these frequencies, what you sense it is via electric fields. So we are in the regime of what we call as long wave. Then we can assume uh, the, the incoming signals as electromagnetic waves, not photons really. And one of the simplest way to basically uh, sense those electric fields is by metals. So what really happens is if you have just metal, any metal, you have a plate. If an electromagnetic field impinges on that plate, it will excite it. And the electrons in the plate will oscillate and there will be an electric field which is which will be produced on the plate. And that's precisely what you are measuring. And the intensity of the electric field is proportional to your incident signal. So this is nothing but antenna. Antenna is just metal. There is no mystery to antennas. Anything can be an antenna. Your bottle, your wire. Antenna comes in different shapes and forms. At the heart of it, it is a metal which can produce electric field on its surface. 
based on the incoming signal right so that is the basics of antenna now the question is how does it modify our science or how does it impact what we want to do and if you are wondering where this cosine square theta mu is coming from why are we so hellbent on taking just that this part will answer your question so you are familiar with larma radiation basically what is the electric field that produced when a charge is oscillating we use also this in synchrotron so this is not specific to antenna any electric field any uh, charge whether it's astrophysical system or an electrical system if you make it accelerate it will produce radiation or it will produce energy so we start from there in that is ha huh. before i get there this figure is basically what we call as dipole antenna it's basically two pieces of metal which is the top half and the bottom half and you are injecting a signal what we call as exciting antenna basically you are injecting something and you want to know how the radiation pattern evolves so if you supply some power how it is distributed on the sky this is what we mean by equation pattern and in antenna theory in general there is something called reciprocity which is you can characterize its properties as a transmitter it will exactly be the same when it receives so in antenna of course this is radio star radio is receivers but for characterization it's always useful to think other way when you are transmitting something how is the power distributed on the sky that's exactly what it is. so what we are interested is in the electric field distribution because the primary field pattern or primary radiation pattern depends on the electric field so you have a dipole antenna the length of the dipole antenna is the smaller there are two arms plus l by 2 minus l by 2 you are viewing or measuring the electric field at a distance of r to an angle of theta that's the set now what you want to know is this comes simply from larma radiation so what you know what you know is what is the electric field distribution now the first assumption we'll make we will realize why we are making this is the length of your metal is very very small compared to the wavelength of it so this category of devices it's called electrically small antenna because in terms of lambda they are very small and the reason why is in general when you have electric field it will change as a function of z axis when you are going from here to here your electric field will change because there is a length there is a delay and delay introduces speed but if your length is very small compared to the wavelength imagine one cycle which is going like this so you can almost assume your electric field to be constant that's the reason we are using this it makes the approach very easy so A very small. We just divide this into segments and basically integrate this. So this is DQ. There is another assumption you can make here. This is basically DQ by DZ and DZ. We we'll replace this by something. R is very far, and I'll come back to how far we are talking. So you are observing this radiation pattern at a very large distance from the light. So in some way, your R, or another assumption that goes in this R is much much higher. So D Q by D Z times D Z. So basically, the rate of flow of charge along the current. Uh, Why are we getting into pendulum? What is it for? 
perpendicular to the length. So I'm not through the derivation. I'll point you to a very nice reference that I have taken this from. But essential value of astronomy. Uh, I'll give you the reference. Uh, there is a very nice derivation of this. But eventually what you will get is the following. Which is E of perpendicular here is basically this. Don't have to go into the details of any of this. This comes because the, the current that you are supplying here is assumed to be a second. Now, are you familiar with pointing lecture? What is it? But what is it physically? So we'll do that. Pointing vector here. And this, the pointing vector you will find is basically proportional to, or actually equal to, the end of the Now, there are, again, let's not get lost in the math here, but just very simple two quantities that I want you to take notice of. It depends on per theta. So basically the rate at which the power is flowing of its angular distribution depends on the sin square theta component. And it depends on L by lambda ratio. So basically I can do it this. L by lambda, what square? Six. Now, this is very, very important. And that's why when I began, I said we are doing electrically small. Which means that the dimension of the antenna, that is this L, is very, very small compared to the lambda. Now, why this is important? If that is the case, when you have electrically very short system, your pattern, the radiation pattern, will just have an angular dependence of center. And that's the reason we have been using this every day. But the moment your dimension of the antenna starts becoming comparable to wavelength, you no longer can ignore that. And now, in some way, your power pattern is not only angular dependent, but also frequency dependent. And uh, so, right? So now you have a field of view which is independent of ionosphere its frequency dependent. So I'll just end with one thing. How does it matter? I mean, why are we so concerned with our field of view being frequency dependent, right? And the answer lies in something called as mode mixing. So what happens is, you know in foregrounds you have spatial structures. So your brightness changes very rapidly pixel to pixel. You also saw this in the tutorial. Now suppose my field of view is something like this. So the x axis here is theta. And I am looking at very three different frequencies here. So frequency 1, frequency 2, frequency 3, this is the highest frequency, this is the lowest frequency. And I have two sources, one which is spot at 0, so I am looking just up ahead. And there is one source which is slightly off 0. And this is illuminating different parts of my field of view at different frequencies. Now how can such a beam arise? All beams are like this. But so uh, maybe in my next class, I'll give you a very brief demo of how we, how do we know how the beams are. Like this is this was a very simple structure, so you could analytically derive the pointing vector. This becomes analytically impossible at some point. So the moment you start having planar structures or spherical structures or any kind of those kinds of complicated profiles, uh, you have to resort to simulations. So you will have patterns like this. Now suppose my initial spectrum is flat. As a function of frequency, it's flat. But because at this frequency, the highest frequency, my gain, where it is falling on my beam, is, is some value. It falls on what we call as null, where I, my antenna doesn't have a response. 
and here it falls on the what we call as first side low, where it has mod moderate response. So as a function of frequency, at the lowest frequency, I'll, I'll see high value because my beam response is high. At the next frequency, I'll see a zero because my antenna doesn't have a response rate. And at the highest frequency, I'll see some. So even if you started off with a foreground which was spectrally flat, and this is any observational astronomer's dream, just because of the mode mixing, you get something like this. Good luck modeling that. Okay. And this is related to what Prashim was talking about before, which is all these sources do add a lot of complicated structures like this. So ideally, you are best off if your field of view never changed. So at all frequencies, suppose if this source was only illuminating this part of the beam all the time, you will get a flat spectrum with a reduced amplitude. That is much easier to model than this. So ideally, we would want all our beams to be frequency independent, not possible. So then the question arises, what is the variation which is accepted? So that is something we'll address later. But overall, this is the reason why do we care so much about what kind of antennas do we have? And this is a question you will see in all the experiments. Okay? And if you have something like this, all your maximally smooth function just is destroyed, right? There is no way you can model this via maximally smooth functions. So, and this is nothing to do with signal. This is just to do with your primary beam. And that's why we have to correct for these things. Okay. So I think I'll stop here. Any questions at this point? Frequency. So the interesting part is your variations are happening in the spatial domain, but the implications are in the frequency domain. So you are translating your spatial structures in the spectral structure. That this is called mode mixing. And this is primarily contributed by your B, the radiation pattern. Because your gain is low. The gain here and the gain here are different. So the multiplicative factors are different. This is the property of your uh, antenna. Mm -hmm. Which two lines? Mm -hmm. These two. Mm -hmm. This one. This is the spectrum of this galaxy, which is falling on zenith. And because at zenith you don't really have a dependence, you recover the flat line. And the second one is the source which is at the side loop. And because at different frequency side loop gain is different, you will see something like this. So essentially it shows you that two sources in two different parts of your beam will give you different responses, even if they were the same spectral nature. Ah. Yeah. Basically, your wedge goes up in interferometers. Uh, you will have a lot of inflection points, which is instead of a power law, you will have first of all frequency dependence in the power law. Again, that has nothing to do with synchrotron, but your B. And sometimes even that doesn't suffice. So you will have more turning points in your foreground, spectrally. So you may end up with ripples, for example. Not here, but I can show you. Yeah. So it depends how rapidly it's changing with frequency. So if the variation is more rapid, your frequency scales in the TA will be more rapid. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll I'll give you a demo in the next class. How do how do you figure that out? Yes. Huh, so this beam is basically very typical for a dish. So till now I had only talked about dipoles. Dipoles have a sinusoid sine squared theta beam. When you go to dishes, what happens is you have a main lobe, which is this, but then your response doesn't die out completely. You start seeing grating loops, which are basically the side loops. So this is a very typical for a dish antenna. Okay. But this is a toy model. This is not as I mean we ex, we assumed a flat source like flat spectrum. So it's not even galactic. It's more more primitive, and still you see this. Now imagine this with a power law. It becomes more complicated. You have not even included model. As toy model as it can get. Yeah. 
Would it would help. So your foreground models are gone. Yes. And that's why. Why does it matter? It matters precisely for that reason. Yeah. Depends on your antenna design. I'll show you some simulations how for different antennas your variations can be at the scale of signals or other. Right. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, the reason it does it because of these effects. Any other questions? I think we are at time. So you can get back if you have more questions.